Excellent. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I have just a couple things uh, in terms of uh, that I want to say before we jump into the message. Uh, first item, uh, thanks to Des and Richard uh, for, for being here and for uh, their preparation. I appreciate uh, learning from them. Uh, when, when you see someone get up to speak, it's, it's easy for preachers to get up and speak. They, they, you know, they do that all the time. But to have something to say is much harder, right? So it requires preparation and work. So I appreciate Rick and Des for... Uh, Contributing something in that regard, it's helpful. So thank you. <laughs> now, I'm serious. I mean, isn't that the truth? Don't you see people get up all the time, they ramble, and they carry on, and they don't make any point, and there's no yeah. profit to it? And then you watch people do something that's thoughtful and crafted, and it's, it's different. So I appreciate that. Um, thanks to everyone that, that, that attended. I, I know that what happens is, you know, travel is expensive and, you know, costs to be here. So thank you for being here. Uh, if you know the, the reason, it's the audience that you do these things for, right? It, it's the fact that people can come and get a benefit. So thank you for being here and uh, you know investing the time to be here. I'll, I'll just say this for what it's worth. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm just irritated at the whole notion of lockdowns. Uh, you know, I, it irritates me that we couldn't have the conference the last couple of years. It's ridiculous. You can't stop living because of a disease. Right. I mean, the work of the church is fundamental and needs to go on. So I, I have been encouraged being here this weekend, and I, I enjoy seeing folks that I haven't seen in a long time. So thank you for that. Uh, thanks to Connie and the ladies. Uh, the hospitality and food was tremendous. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that. So thank you for that. And then um, finally, I'll just say, Frank, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for all the work that necessary to put on a conference like this. It's not easy to do. There's a lot of planning and details. And so thank you for that. And thank you for your continued faithfulness. So I just, I just wanted to say those things. Okay. Uh, next item. So this is a story. Maybe it's a good one. Maybe it's an embarrassing one, but I'm going to tell it. Um, so one of, there's lots of reasons this, this particular conference is, is special to me and my family, but I'll, I'll give you just one of them. So we were here several years ago and, um, we're sitting about right there, and Rick is up here speaking, and uh, my second oldest son is on his phone the whole time, and I assume he's playing a game, and you know he's clearly not paying any attention, and I'm like, well, I'm going to have to talk to him afterwards, so I, I talk to him afterwards. I say, well, what, what are you doing? And uh, here's what he did. He had been up here visiting Rick's book table. And he'd sort of been encouraged by that. And so he decided he wanted to write his own gospel track. And that's what this is. And so I looked at it, and I was like, well, okay, I, you know, you probably accomplished more in the last hour than I did. <laughs> so I guess I can't be too critical. But, you know, one of the reasons I share that with you is this. I mean, one, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of him and proud of that. But, but, but the other thing about it is, you know, what I find to be the case is... Um, being in the right place, being in the right people, having the right experiences, there's a benefit for, for your soul and your family, right? I, I don't think he would have done that if we were at home doing something else. But he, he saw this, he was sort of inspired by it and decided to do it. So praise the Lord. So that was a, a blessing in our life and that, that came out of this conference. Okay, enough of my stories. Um, what I want to talk about this morning is this. And let, let me open us in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for this time. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the clarity of understanding that you give in the scriptures. We pray, Lord, that each day we would be growing in grace. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, I want to talk this morning about forgiveness. And I'll tell you uh, my understanding of that and... Um, then we'll jump into uh, so, to look at it more deeply. So the way that I always understood forgiveness was simply the, the following way. And that is that what the Lord did on the cross is he died for man's sin. And, and when he shed his blood, he paid for all of the sins of all humanity. This is a rather remarkable thing to think about, right? So in, other words, in, a, in a finite period of time, Jesus Christ paid for all of the sins for all of mankind for all of eternity. 
Right? Is, is that true? That when was, in other words, the punishment for sin is eternal. Well, in a finite period of time, Jesus Christ paid the eternal penalty, penalty for all men for all of their sins. Sort of incredible, right? Uh, but the way that you obtain forgiveness is you have to have faith in Christ. The fact that Christ died for your sins, that makes it possible for you to be forgiven and saved. But if you reject the gospel, you're not saved and your sins aren't forgiven. And what will happen is you will then pay for those sins yourself. So the, the gospel, of course, then is, is, is critically important, right? Because if you don't believe it, then, then you don't have forgiveness and you have to pay for your sins. And then not, not long ago, um, I came to understand there's another way to think about this. And, and the other way to think about this is, is the following. Um, some will teach that the lost already have their sins forgiven, e even before they believe the gospel. That when, when Christ died on the cross, the lost received forgiveness at that point in time. And so, therefore, God does not impute sins to the lost today, and the lost are already reconciled to God. And that's the way that that school of thought goes. And I want to look at that today, because I, I, I don't think that that's what Scripture teaches. And so I wanted to look at that together with you. Um, before we jump into that, I'll just make the, these sort of you know, introductory comments. So Acts 17, 11 says this. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Now, I'll just make a comment on that. What I think happens a lot today is people think they have done their homework because they watched another video. That's just my personal opinion, right? In other words, it's okay to watch videos, and it's okay to learn things from people, but you still, you always have to do the personal, individual searching the scriptures yourself. It's not, like, so let's say, here's what happens. Let's say I teach something, you're not sure it's right. You say, well, here's what I'll do. I'll listen to a video by Frank. So you listen to a video by Frank, Frank agrees. Okay, we're done, right? I did my research. I got two videos. Well, it doesn't work that way, does it? You have to do the individual personal study yourself. You have to search the scriptures whether those things are so. And then Romans 14, 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. What's it say? Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So I'm going to show you some things this morning. The fact that I say it doesn't mean anything, obviously. What you're going to need to do is you're going to need to search the scriptures for yourself and figure out what is true. So here's an outline of what we're going to cover. There's, there's two sections. The first section, I'm going to cover two supposed proof passages for the lost forgiven position. And just to say it again to make sure that I'm clear on this, the, the, the position we're considering is the following. Some say that the lost already have forgiveness, even before they have faith in the gospel. The lost already have forgiveness. Sins are not being imputed to them, and they are already reconciled to God. So I'm going to call that the lost forgiven position. So we'll look at two supposed proof passages that people use, and then I'm going to give you, if time permits, ten passages that disprove the lost forgiven position. So let's start with the, the, the proof verses that they use. And we'll look first at Romans chapter 5, verse 10, if you would. So open your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, verse 10. <coughs> Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Now while you're getting it, I'll, I'll just make this point. Obviously, the single most important thing to understand is, is the gospel. And so we need to understand the gospel to be saved. And then there are things that are, um, that are related to how we get forgiveness, how salvation works. And it seems to me it's very important to have an accurate understanding of those. So Romans 5, verse 10. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so it's the part of that verse that says, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Some interpret that to mean that all, all humanity, including the lost, 
were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Well, keep Romans 5, get 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll look at verse 5. 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now what's clearly the case is Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for all. He shed his blood for all men. He made it possible, certainly, for all to be reconciled. But, but is it true that all are already reconciled? Well, notice this. So in, in Romans 5.10, you see where it says we were reconciled to God? Well, we is a pronoun, right? So if, if we is a pronoun, what that means is pronouns have antecedents. So we need to look prior to Romans 5.10 to understand what the we is. So guess where we should start? Romans 5.9, right? Doesn't that make sense? Look at Romans, yeah, that wasn't a trick question. <laughs> Romans 5.9, look at this. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Well, whoever the we is in verse 10, I'm just going to submit to you that it's the same we in verse 9, right? If I say we in this sentence, and then the next sentence I use the word we again, I'm referring to the same group of people. That's how it works, right? So in 5 verse 9, the we is justified by his blood. So does that include lost people? It doesn't, right? Lost people are not justified. They're not declared righteous. And then notice what it says right after that. We shall be saved from wrath. Well, are the lost saved from wrath? They're plainly not, right? So the we in Romans 5 verse 9 is defined to only refer to saved people because it's only saved people who are justified by his blood and saved, by, saved from wrath. Now notice this, Just let's do this a little further. You see how it says in Romans 5, 9, being now justified by his blood. How do you get justified by his blood? What do you have to do? Look at Romans 5, verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being, notice what it says, justified by faith. So how does someone get justified? They have to have faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what I'm going to submit to you is this. If, if, you, if you're just reading Romans 5 naturally, without any, you know, just reading it for what it says. When 5 verse 1 says, therefore, being justified by faith, that obviously only is believers, right? I mean, they have faith, so they're believers. So the we in verse 1 is people that are justified by faith, that are believers. When you read down to verse 9, and it says then much more than being now justify his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That's still believers because it's people who are saved from wrath, who are justified. And then when you get to verse 10, it's the same we. For if, we, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So just to be clear on this before we go to the next passage, all of humanity can be reconciled to God because Christ died for their sins. But you're not reconciled until you are justified by faith. Right? Isn't that, that just seems straightforward, right? Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. This is a second passage that is, is often used by some to say that the lost are reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 5, 18. And all things are of God 
who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So God has clearly reconciled some people to himself and it's past tense, it's already occurred. God who hath reconciled us to himself. Look at verse 19. To wit, that God was in Christ, notice, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So when you read verse 19, what it says is God was reconciling the world unto himself. And so some read that and they say, well, it doesn't say that he reconciled the saved. It says that he reconciled who? The world, the entire world. Well, that obviously includes lost people, and therefore all are reconciled unto God. Read the next verse, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, now notice this next part. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Well, doesn't that prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that the lost aren't reconciled? What is Paul saying in that verse? We pray you be reconciled to God. Does he have to ask people to be reconciled if they already are? I mean, isn't the whole point of that verse that what he's saying is, in verse 19, it says, have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. He gave us a message that we have to tell others. And that message is described in verse 20. What do we do? We pray you to be reconciled unto God. That means you aren't. You follow me? Does, is there anywhere in the scriptures where Paul prays a saved person to have eternal security? Is there, is there a time where he prays a saved person to be justified? No, because they, they already are, right? You, you don't have to pray someone that's already justified to be justified. You don't have to pray someone that, that's justified to have eternal security. They already have it. The reason he has to pray people to be reconciled unto God is they're not. Isn't that obvious? And, and, and by the way, it, isn't that what witnessing is? It, isn't the whole act of witnessing the, the fact that the wages of sin is death, the penalty for our sins is hell, Christ died for our sins, and what you do when you witness to someone is you implore them, you, you pray them, you beseech them, you obey them. Friend, you're a sinner. You're going to go to an eternal hell. The good news is Christ died for your sins and you don't have to go there. Isn't that the most simplest understanding of what the gospel is? And so what you do when you engage in the gospel ministry, by that I mean you tell people the gospel, is you're praying them to be reconciled to God. They're not yet. And they need to be. Which is, that's the good news. The good news is that they can be. So those two passages that we looked at, those are sometimes used to suggest that the lost are already reconciled, but it seems to me if you just read the passages, they tell you that's not the case. You're not reconciled to God until you have faith in the gospel. So let's turn to the, the, the second uh, section of what I want to cover. And there, there's ten passages that I'm going to show you that, that prove that the lost do not already have forgiveness. And we'll look at these. We'll get through as many as we can. And I'll just tell you as we're jumping into this that, that all of these proofs are independent. And what I mean by that is if you think one of them is true, it proves the point that the lost already don't have forgiveness. So let's just start in Acts 26. So this is proof number one. It's Acts 26, and we're going to look at verse 14. Acts 26, 14. This is a recounting of what happens in Acts 9 when the Lord appears to Paul. Acts 26, 14. And when we were all fallen to the earth, 
I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Verse 16, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. So this is clearly Paul being sent to the Gentiles. Now notice what it says in the next verse, verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Now read the next phrase. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. Well, did they already have it? Or did they need it? They obviously needed it. I mean, in fact, the whole point of that passage is, Paul, I'm saving you. I'm sending you the Gentiles. And the reason why I'm sending you the Gentiles, I'm sending you with a message that if they believe, they will then have the forgiveness of sins. If they already had the forgiveness of sins, he didn't need to send them. Isn't that what it's saying? Just in case I'm not being clear, how can you say that the lost already have forgiveness of sins when the very verse says that Paul is being sent because they needed to receive the forgiveness of sins? I, I just don't think it works. Proof number two. Get 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. Now I'll just speak for myself. I, I, I honestly think Acts 26 ends the discussion, just personally. That's my opinion. Um, but we have more time, so we press on. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. Well, isn't verse 15 a list of sins? When it says, they killed the Lord Jesus, well, that's a sin. And their own prophets, that's a sin. And have persecuted us, that's a sin. And they please not God. Th those are all sins, aren't they? Verse 16. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Notice the next phrase. To fill up their sins all way. What's that verse saying? You know what they're doing there as they continue in these wicked activities? They're filling up their sins. Which means sins are being imputed against them, doesn't it? Now, now you know this, but Matthew 12, 36 says, Men shall give account of every idle word that they have spoken. You, you know what happens at the, at the great white throne judgment? I don't know if you've ever reflected on this. But when you take verses like Matthew 12, 36, Men shall give account of every idle word that they have spoken. The way that most criminal prosecutions work is the following. When, when someone is charged with a crime, they are charged with a very specific crime, meaning that they're alleged to have violated a particular criminal statute on a particular day. Right? It's very specific in its allegation. When you're prosecuted for a crime, it's a specific charge. It's not every bad thing you've ever done. The government has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you committed the elements of that offense. What that means is, in, in a typical criminal prosecution, people are not charged with every crime they've ever committed. It, it's just the ones that the government has sufficient evidence that they're moving forward on. There's frequently other things that they just don't pursue. That's the way man's justice system works. But guess how the great white throne works? Men shall give account of what? 
They were at a word. Have you ever stopped to try to count your sins? It's more than a dozen. <laughs> right? I mean, you're talking hundreds of thousands. I mean, I, it's, it's unfathomable, right? The thought of foolishness is sin. <laughs> Right? To him that knoweth that you do to do good and doeth it not. Do you, do you have any idea about the, the, the sheer quantity of sins that someone has? Do you ever read Romans 2? Where, where it talks about how the lost treasure of wrath. You know what that means? Every additional day you live as a lost person, people think longevity in life is a blessing. It's a blessing if you're saved, maybe. Because you could go to heaven earlier. But guess what happens if you're lost and you live another day? You're just adding a list of sins to the account, right? <laughs> That's what happens. If you're lost and you live another day, you're adding another day of wicked thoughts and actions and words to your account. And that's exactly what 1 Thessalonians 2 when it's talking about to fill up their sins all the way. What happens with I, I hate to say it, what happens with lost people every single moment is they keep adding to that account. Well, how does that verse make any sense at all if the lost already have their sins forgiven? They're not forgiven. Because what happens is what lost people do on a day-by-day -day basis is they fill up their sins. They treasure up wrath. It's not a happy thought, but it's a real thought. It, 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 it's, what, it's what occurs. <coughs> Get Romans 3, verse 7. Romans chapter 3, verse 7. This is the, the, the next proof. Romans chapter 3, verse 7. Romans chapter 3, verse 7. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, notice what it says, why yet am I also judged as a sinner. Is God going to judge some people as sinners? He is. What happens at the great white throne judgment is that people are judged for their actions, for their deeds. And what Romans 3, 7 indicates is they're judged as sinners. Well, then are, have, do they already have forgiveness or do they not? How can they already have forgiveness if God specifically says he's going to judge them as a sinner? It won't work. I'm suggesting to you that the, the, the idea is just, it's contrary to the, what the very verses of Scripture say. Proof number four, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, now notice this, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So what does the word laden mean? Laden means heavily loaded or weighted down. The thing that I think of, you, you ever think, see like donkeys or pack animals and they've got like all of this luggage, packs of stuff on them, you know, big heavy things that are put on the animal. Well, they're, 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 they're laden, right? That they have this great burden. Well, look at what this verse says. And lead captive silly women laden with sins. That means they're heavily loaded with sins. Isn't that what it means? So do they already have forgiveness? How can you already have the forgiveness of sins if you're heavily laden with sin? You can't. Proof number five, Colossians 3, 5. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. Colossians 3, 5. 
Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Now notice this list. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now all those things that are listed there, those are sins, aren't they? Fornication, uncleanness, evil concupiscence, covetousness, those are sins. Look at verse 6. For which things sake? Well, what are the, the which things? It's those list of sins, isn't it? For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience? What Colossians 3, 5, and 6 is saying is here's this list of sins, and as a result of it, for which things sake those sins... What comes on the children of disobedience? Wrath. Well, let me just ask you this. If God's already forgiven all those sins, why is he, what's he upset about? Why would he have wrath against those things if he's already forgiven them? Well, the fact is he hasn't. Christ died on the cross for man's sin. He made the payment for our sins. But you don't get the benefit of that until you have faith. I mean, if you don't believe the gospel, you don't have forgiveness of sins. You just don't. Look with me at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 5. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now Romans 4, 5 is obviously about a believer, isn't it? I mean, it couldn't be more clear, right? It's it's believing on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. That's a saved person. That's a believer. Now notice verse 6. Even as David also describeth. So verse 6 is going to be a further description of verse 5. Even as David also describeth. Well, notice what it says. The blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Well, that's got to be a believer, right? God doesn't impute righteousness unto lost people, does he? He doesn't. Now, notice verse 7. Saying. Well, verse 7 is what David said that was described in verse 6. My point is that as you read verses 5, 6, and 7, can you see that they all go together? So now verse 7, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. And whose sins are covered. Well, in verse 7, that's obviously a blessing. Who's it referring to? Is that referring to lost people? Or is it referring to those unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works? Those that in verse 5, whose faith is counted for righteousness. Isn't it obvious that verse 7 is only referring to saved people? I mean, that's, that, that's what the passage is saying. Those aren't references to the lost. Proof number seven, get Revelation 20. Now while you're, you're turning there, I'll just make this point. It, it seems to me each one of these things we're looking at independently disproves the position, right? Because each one of them demonstrates that, that the lost do not already have their sins forgiven. So if you want to say that their sins are forgiven, you have to have some sort of answer to all of these, right? And if there's one of them you can't, then the position is wrong. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Now this is the great white throne. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. 
and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Now notice this part, according to their works. So what are they judged on the basis of? Their works, obviously. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. So verse 12 and verse 13 have said to us twice that what happens at the great white throne judgment is that it is a judgment of works. Now keep Revelation 20, but get John chapter 7. John chapter 7. John chapter 7 and verse 7. John 7 verse 7. Notice what the Lord says here. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Why? Because I testify of it that the works thereof are what? Evil. Evil. Guess what? You know what the works of the world are? They are evil. When Revelation 20 describes the great white throne judgment, and it says twice that people are judged according to their works, guess what they're judged according to? They're judged according to their works, which are evil works, which is another way of saying sin. Right? That's what happens at the great white throne judgment. Listen, if there weren't a million reasons to get saved, I'm going to give you one more. If you don't get saved, here's what happens. At the great white throne judgment, every embarrassing, wicked thing you've done that you've tried to hide is going to be manifested to the universe. Right? The thing that I tell folks from time to time when they, when they wonder about whether or not they're sinners. You know, you, people sometimes have the idea, well, look, I've never robbed a bank, so I'm not really a bad person. Okay, we'll do this. For the next week, just keep a diary and write down every thought that you have, and then next week, just stand up and read it to the group. <laughs> just tell us what you've been thinking about. Well, no one in the right mind is going to do that. I'm and certainly not me. <laughs> because the re... Well, what is the rea the painful reality is this flesh is so wicked that it just sins constantly, right? So when people are judged according to their works at the great white throne judgment, it's more than obvious what it's talking about. They're going to be judged for their evil works. They're going to be judged for their sins. Well, if God's going to judge them for their sins at the great white throne judgment, he's going to declare them guilty, and then he's going to throw them in the lake of fire. How can you say their sins are already forgiven? The, the whole purpose of the great white throne judgment is that their sins are not forgiven. And since their sins are not forgiven, God is just in pouring out wrath upon them. Now the tragedy of all of this is that it's avoidable. Since Christ died on the cross, what we can do and should do is, uh, rather than me pay for those myself, I will accept what Christ did for me. I will accept his payment for my sin. I will have what Romans 3.25 calls faith in his blood. I'll trust what he did for me so I don't have to pay for them myself. But if, if I do what so much of humanity does and says, no, I'm good. I'll take care of it. Not, not long ago, uh, a, a, a well-known American politician said that he, he didn't need forgiveness, that he would handle it himself. It's dead, but that's, that's just lunacy. That, 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 that's just, just lunacy, right? So, friends, all I'm saying is if, if, if the great white throne judgment exists, which it does, it's all about the judgment of sin. And therefore, it, it can't be the case that the lost already have forgiveness or what God is doing there doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Proof number eight. Get Colossians 2. Verse 13. Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 13.
Colossians 2.13. And you, notice this, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So notice what that verse says about the lost. And the you there, by the way, so let's do it this way. The you there is the Colossians, right? Paul's writing to the Colossians. And what he says about them is, is being dead in your sins. So there was a point in time where the Colossians were what? They were spiritually dead in what? In their sins. Well, guess what? If you're spiritually dead in your sins, guess what you don't have? You don't have the forgiveness of sins if you're dead in your sins. Now, notice what happens here. And you being dead in your sins, that's what they were. Then notice what it says. Hath he quickened? He made them alive. How did he do that? Having forgiven you all trespasses. Isn't Colossians 2.13 very clear in what it's saying? In other words, the Colossians, just like everyone else on earth, there was a point in time where they were dead in their sins. And when they were dead in their sins, they didn't have the forgiveness of sins. But what God did is he quickened them. He made them spiritually alive. How did he make them spiritually alive according to that verse? He gave them forgiveness. Until they had forgiveness, they weren't quickened. They weren't spiritually alive. They were dead. And it specifically says dead in their sins. Which means they didn't have forgiveness of sins when they were lost. They needed it. They could obtain it. But they didn't get it until they had faith in the blood. Proof number nine, Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened. To quicken is to bring to life. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. So the Ephesians were just like the Colossians. They were dead in trespasses and sins before they were quickened. Now, now just follow this through with me. If you want to say the lost already have forgiveness of sins, then you have to say the lost have already been quickened. And that they've already been made spiritually alive. Does that make any sense? It doesn't. Look at verse 5. Now I'm going to read verse 5 and, and, and tell me if this isn't a verse about salvation. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, so that's past tense, hath quickened us together with Christ. So we were dead in sins, and then he quickened us, and then what is the very next thing it says? By grace ye are saved. Isn't that verse about salvation? In other words, what happens when you get saved is you were dead in sins, but then what happens is you're quickened together with Christ, and that's a result of the fact that you got saved. And if you didn't get saved, then you're not quickened together with Christ, and you're still dead in your sins. Let's get Romans 3.25. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Romans chapter 3.25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Now let's talk about this just for a minute. What does the word propitiation mean? So I'll read to you from the Webster's 1828. It's the act of appeasing wrath and conciliating the favor of an offended person. In other words, propitiation in Romans 3.25 is the satisfaction of God's wrath. So how does God feel about the lost man? He has wrath against their sin, doesn't he? 
He does. But when you have faith in the blood, God's wrath is satisfied because he counts your faith for righteousness. Now notice what verse 25 then is saying. Propitiation only comes through faith. Isn't that what it says? Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, how? Through faith in his blood. Get with me Romans 1.18. Now, if we're thinking about propitiation, in other words, the satisfaction of God's wrath, the question we should ask ourselves is, what is he upset about? Why is he angry? Why, why does he have wrath to begin with? Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. In other words, God has wrath against sin. Isn't that what it's saying? If he has wrath against ungodliness and unrighteousness? Well, think about this with me. If God's wrath is against sin, and propitiation is the satisfaction of God's wrath, and you only get that through faith in his blood, doesn't that tell you that the lost don't have forgiveness? Otherwise, why would God be angry? You see my point? If his wrath is against sin, and you already have forgiveness of sins, then why does God need to be propitiated? The reason why he has to is you don't enjoy forgiveness of sins until you have faith in his blood. Okay, so I told you I had 10, but I have more. So, <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. Colossians 1, verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. So the, the you in that verse has been reconciled. Now the question is, is the you in that verse, does that refer to saved people, or does that refer to all of humanity, including lost people? Because whoever the you is has been reconciled. We know that, the verse says it. The question is, who is the you? So read verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death, now notice what it says, to present you, so it's the same people here, holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now, does that sound like lost people to you? Does God present people that are lost as holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight? I mean, he doesn't. They're, they're wicked. They're unrighteous. Look at verse 3, or verse 23, I'm sorry. See how it says, if ye, ye and you are both second person plural pronouns. So we know this just real quick. So first person, I, me, mine. Second person, you, yours. Well, at one point in the English language, the second person, person pronouns included thee and thou and ye and you. Ye and you are both second person plural pronouns, okay? At one point, ye was the nominative and you was the objective form. But the point is, when you go from Colossians 121 and it says you, and then verse 22 says you, and 23 says ye, it's the same group of people, okay? It's a different pronoun form, but it's referring to the same group of people. Now, notice verse 23. If ye continue in the faith. Well, is the ye lost people? If it's talking about them continuing in the faith, they never started in the faith, right? Isn't that the problem with lost people? 
They never got saved to begin with. They never had faith. Verse 23 is talking about people that continue in the faith. Now, notice, look at Colossians 1.21. Look at the end of the verse. You see how there's no period? Now look at Colossians 1.22. You see how there's no period? So Colossians 1.21, 22, and 23 is all part of the same sentence. There's no period, and it has this you, you, ye, all referring to the same people. So the you that are reconciled in verse 21 is the same people in verse 23 that have to continue in the faith. So they have to be saved people that's being referred to in verse 21. Let me say one more thing on this passage. Look at verse 21 again. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. It says they were sometime enemies, and then they were reconciled. Now what reconciliation is, as you understand, of course, reconciliation is when someone who used to be your enemy now becomes your friend, and you're reconciled. Well, if you then want to say that the lost are reconciled, then God pours out his wrath on his friends in the lake of fire. Doesn't that follow? If you're going to say that the lost are reconciled, then you're saying they were enemies, but now they've been made friends. And the lost clearly go to the lake of fire, so then what that means is God pours out his wrath on people he has reconciled and made his friends in the lake of fire. Does that sound reasonable? Or is that actually a slander against God's character? I mean, what, what kind of God do you have to be if you reconcile people, you make them your friends, and then you say, I'm now going to cause you to suffer conscious torment day and night forever and ever. God doesn't operate that way. So I'll, I'll, I'll sum up with this then. And let's just cover this to make sure that we're clear on this. Jesus Christ died for all men. Amen. Limited atonement is false. Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for all. When he died on the cross, and this is, this is God's graciousness, God has perfect total understanding. When Jesus Christ dies on the cross, God the Father knows, what I'm doing right now at this moment is my son is suffering the wrath for billions of people that will despise my grace. That, that's what happened, right? Yes. He died for billions that spit in his face and said, I don't want your grace. But he died for them anyway because God's desire, God's heart was, I'm going to have my son die for all of humanity so that it is possible for all of them to be saved because he wanted all of them to be saved. So Christ died for all of them. And when he shed his blood, he paid the full price. What drives me crazy is this. I'll, I'll hear people say, God saves by grace, but you've got to live it. So what you're saying then is this. When Christ died on the cross, he did 99% of it, but you're going to complete that last 1%. How dare you? What, what you're saying then is his sacrifice was incomplete. It was not. It was perfect. It was, it was sufficient. But the only way you get the benefit from it is you have to believe. Now, this is my opinion. You can disagree with me if you want. The reason I don't like to say that the lost already have forgiveness is I believe it is a false comfort. I would never tell a lost person your sins are already forgiven because they're not. Do, do you remember the sword of Damocles? The sword of Damocles is the, the king and there's this sword above his head that's always hanging there because what happens is as the king, you're always in danger of a foreign adversary 
or, or someone within your court that wants to kill you and take your place. You're always in peril. Isn't the reality of the lost man that every second he's in existential peril? D doesn't he have the danger that this moment might be my last breath and then I go face the living God and give account for my sins? It, it, I mean, I'm not trying to exaggerate. Is, isn't that a real danger? It is. And the danger is you're going to be there, you're going to give account, and there's not going to be any of this funny business excuses stuff. Right? You're going to give account for every single thing you've ever done. That's why you should not tell lost people they have forgiveness. Because they're going to show up there and they're going to give account. Every single thing. Do you know how horrible that is? The lost do not have forgiveness. They can, but they have to get that through faith in his blood. And until they have faith in his blood, they need to understand the wrath of God abides on them. Amen? Amen. So, we say all that to say, Here's the good news. The good news is Christ died for our sins. You can have eternal life as a free gift. You can, you can have it as an eternal possession the moment you believe the gospel. But until you believe the gospel, uh, I can give you no comfort. Because you're going to have to answer for your sins. But the good news is you don't have to. You just have to believe what Christ did for you. Amen? Amen. Father God, thank you for this time. We thank you that Jesus Christ paid the full penalty for our sins. We thank you for your, your graciousness. We thank you, Lord, that he satisfied your justice so that we don't have to. We pray, Lord, that we would be busy about the preaching of the gospel, that we would be telling the lost how to be saved. We pray that we would be diligent in that. We pray that you would give us doors of utterance to do that. We rejoice, Lord, in being in the body of Christ. We rejoice in being part of your family. And we give you all the glory. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen.